Hey there, I'm Joey Santos, the online pastor here at Christ Church. Welcome to CC Life Plus. Thank you so much for checking us out. Listen, you probably saw a lot of content here, right? For kids, adults, uh, music, podcasts. That's why we created this for you. So listen, go ahead, fill out this form right here because we created this with you in mind so we can connect. It's all about engagement. So we wanna talk with you, we wanna engage with you, we wanna discover about new ways that we can grow together in Christ through technology. There was an influencer who became insanely popular Everybody started following him. Then, one day, he stood up for something he believed in. People got angry. The establishment called him an extremist, said he shouldn't be allowed to share his views. They would stop at nothing to shut him up. So they did what they had to do. They nailed him to a cross. Good 
Good morning, Church of the Bar. Brad Wilson, good to be with you today. And uh, hey, we're we're in a we're in a new year, which means a new teaching series for us. And uh, you know, from last weekend, we were talking a lot about um, what this year looks like, kind of sharing with you the direction we want to go. And so this year, a big theme for us at Christ Church, Church of the Bar, is discipleship, and we want discipleship to happen. Um, within the the church at the bar, uh, amongst e- you all, and, and, and we want the church at the bar to be a place where discipleship happens. We also want discipleship to be something that happens um, in you and within your life. And what we are very good at doing in the, the church is we talk about things, we have ideas, we, we, we kind of um, put things like, we, we have these theories of, of what we can do or where we want to go or what we want things to look like. But sometimes the church struggles, the church in general struggles from taking these ideas, these theories, these concepts, these thoughts, and, and taking them from thought level down to like action level. Taking it from something we think about or, um, or, or we dream about to something that's a part of who we are and what we do. And so over the next couple of months, we are committed to walking through this idea of discipleship together. Like, what is it? What's it look like? What, what does it mean? Is it something we can do? Because we, we want you to understand what a disciple does. We want you to understand what Jesus expects from us, that he does inspe- uh, expect all of us to be disciples. And we want to simplify this. We want this to be something that you can understand, something you can wrap your mind around, something that you can put into place in, in your life. And this is what I appreciate about Jesus. What Jesus calls us to do, what he commands us to do, what he wants us to do, he just doesn't leave us guessing on what that looks like. Some people do that. I don't know, maybe you've worked for someone, uh, maybe there's someone in your family, maybe you do this. Is You ask people to do things, but you don't describe to them or don't detail to them what that, that thing you need them to do looks like. Right? It's like if anyone comes and says, hey, I want you to clean up my backyard and, and, and I want you to kind of organize it and make it usable for the spring. Someone asks you to do it, you say, well, great, what do you want me to do? Well, just figure it out. Okay, that leaves a lot to be interpreted, that leaves a lot to be figured out. But if someone comes in and says, hey, I need you to cut down these trees, I need you to put in a, a, a patio back here, I want these types of chairs, I want this type of fire pit, and, and here's where I want everything to go, that's much easier to follow, that's much easier to do. Same thing here that Jesus does for us. He wants us to be on the same page with him on his expectations and what he wants us to do. So he gives us the strategy, the game plan, the orders, whatever you want to call it. He gives those things to us, and we see these at the, at the end of Matthew chapter 28. Now before we get into that, I want to stop right now, and, and I want us to jump into our first question this morning. And, and, and here's the question. Think about the Bible and think about different topics or areas of the Bible. But what is one area or topic in the Bible that maybe over the years, maybe recently, maybe you're new to the Bible, new to faith, but what is one area or topic in the Bible that you've struggled to understand? Talk about this um, in, in in your group time, and then we'll be back in a few minutes to jump into Matthew chapter 28 today.
Okay, Church of the Bar, we're back. And let's jump into Matthew chapter 28. Because when I left off, I, I told you that Jesus gives us the, the game plan, the orders on what we're to do. We read that in Matthew chapter 28, beginning in verse 18. The Bible says this. Then Jesus came to them and said, All authority, make note of that, underline that, All authority in heaven and on earth has been given to me. Therefore, go and make disciples of all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit, and teaching them to obey everything I have commanded you. And surely, I am with you always to the very end of the age. So people want to know, and people often ask the question, okay, what's, what's the strategy of the church? What's God's plan? Boom, there it is right there. Go and make disciples of all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father, Son, and the Holy Spirit, and teaching them to obey everything I have commanded you. Now, you've probably heard this before. You've probably heard someone say a variation of this before. I've heard a couple of big themes in my time here at Christ Church, which is about 20 years. I, I, I've heard the idea of, of love God, love people. I've heard the, the idea of, of, of don't sit and take, go and make. And, and what do both those things have in common? Both those things have in common is that we love God, we're going to listen to God, and we're going to go and hopefully help other people love God and meet God like we have as well. But like I said earlier, the thing, it, it, here's the thing, it's not just enough to hear about it, but it has to be a part of who we are. Like the, the making disciples, it's a great idea, it's a great concept, but it has to be a part of, of who I am. It has to be a part of who you are. Because if it's not a part of us, we're not going to do it. And the big C church, you know, that's a kind of a term that refers to, to, to all churches. The big C church struggles with this, Right? It struggles with, with making this idea of, hey, we're going to be about people, we're going to make disciples. The Big C Church struggles with that, and the question is why. So what I want to do today is I want to attempt uh, to address that question of why does the Big C Church, why do churches struggle to make disciples? I want to try to answer that today by looking at two areas that we tend to wrestle with Jesus because of these two areas. And here's the first area this morning. It's, you're going to have your doubts. You will have your doubts. Let's go back a few verses in Matthew chapter 20, to verse 16. The Bible says, Then the eleven disciples went to Galilee, to the mountain where Jesus had told them to go. When they saw him, they worshipped him, but some doubted. See, following Jesus, let's be clear about this. Following Jesus, being a disciple of Jesus, doesn't mean you won't have doubts. It's going to happen, and, and we see it happening here. And if it happened to these 11 guys, right, because the, the Bible and, and scholars say that when, you, verse 17, it says, when they saw him, they worshiped him, but some doubted that Matthew writes in a way, but it refers to the some doubted is all 11. So if all 11 of these guys who had spent three and a half years with Jesus, who saw him perform miracles, saw him raised from the dead, if they still had doubts, it's going to happen with us. Now, the word here for doubt is distazo. And what this word does not mean is it does not mean that they refuse to believe, but that they waver in their belief. They had a little uncertainty, a, a little indecision, but it wasn't an unbelief. Now we see this word for doubt used only one other time in the Bible, and that is where Peter is, is trying to walk on water. And he begins to sink, and Jesus reaches out his hand, pulls him up out of the water, and says, Peter, wh why did you doubt? And that word for doubt there described Peter in that moment. It describes them in this moment on the mountain with Jesus. So when we read that they worshipped him but doubted, it's describing them as being hesitant, not resistant. And that's a good description of us at times. There are times when it's easy for us to believe, but then there are other times where it's more difficult, where we may be more hesitant to believe. Not resistant, just hesitant. John Ortberg writes this in his book, Faith and Doubt. He says, as long as you have faith, you will have doubts. I sometimes use the following illustration when I'm speaking. I tell the audience that I have a $20 bill in my hand and I ask a volunteer for a volunteer who believes me. And usually only a few hands go up. And then I tell the volunteer that I'm about to destroy their faith. I open my hand and show them the $20 bill. The reason I, I, that I can say I'm destroying their faith is that now they know I hold the bill. They see the bill and they don't need faith anymore. 
Faith is required only when we have doubts, when we do not know for sure. When knowledge comes, faith is no more. He continues, sometimes a person is tempted to think, I can't become a Christian because I still have doubts. I'm still not sure. But as long as doubts exist, as long as the person is still uncertain, that is the only time faith is needed. When the doubts are gone, the person doesn't need faith anymore, knowledge has come. Ortberg finishes up by saying that that was Paul's point in 1 Corinthians chapter 13, verse 12, where Paul says, Now we see but a poor reflection, as in a mirror, then we shall see face to face. Now I know in part, then I shall fully know, even as I am fully known. Paul is emphasizing here, in Corinth, when Paul writes this, Corinth was a place that, that they were known for producing mirrors. But at this day and age, this time in history, when they were producing these mirrors, they did not give the best reflection. You would get a reflection, but it would be blurry. It wouldn't be clear. You, you, you couldn't completely see. Now, we have an advantage today that there are mirrors all over our world. We have little mirrors we carry with us. We have larger mirrors in our homes. And the idea being that when we go and, and we're getting ready or we look in a mirror, we see the reflection of ourselves and, and we see maybe what we like in an outfit or what we don't like in an outfit. We, we see maybe, okay, I, I, need to, uh, I need to fix my hair a little bit, or I, I need to do this, or maybe I need to add a little makeup. Whatever it is, we look in the mirror, and, and we see these things. But we know that what we see in the mirror is what we look like. Paul's point, though, was for them is that using this illustration of a mirror, it's like just as you couldn't get the clearest picture looking in a mirror, he says, we still don't know everything about Jesus because we haven't seen him face to face. So that's why the need for faith is there. We still have these doubts, but once we see him, once we fully know who he is, and we don't get a, 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 a imperfect reflection, but we can see him face to face, he said that changes everything. See, for you and me, we're always going to wrestle with faith and doubt until we see Jesus face to face for the first time in our lives. But that wrestling with faith and doubt it doesn't mean we can't be a Christian. It doesn't mean we can't be a disciple. And it doesn't mean we can't disciple others. It's just the, the, it's just a, a true statement of, of the struggle we will go through through this life. This brings us to our second question today. Speaking of faith, when it comes to faith, what is it that causes the most doubts in your life? Take a few minutes, talk about this, and we'll be back to continue on.
All right, Church of the Bar, we are back. And so we just wrapped up that kind of that first area, which causes us to struggle at times uh, in this idea of, of being disciples or of making discipleship and, and making that a part of who we are. And because we talked about we have doubts. Here's the second area. We have an authority issue. Go back to verse 18. Then Jesus came to them and said, all authority in heaven and on earth has been given to me. He's telling the disciples, he's telling us today, I have the authority. It's mine. You don't have it. I have it. And we struggle with authority in our lives as humans. Always have, always will. It's a characteristic of this world. The ways of this world con are, are in conflict with Jesus. Our, our world's about, in, in, in some essence, it's about who has the authority, who has the power, who has the control. Jesus says, I have it, but we want it. And so there's this constant struggle with this. The Bible says in Ephesians chapter 2 that once you were dead because of your disobedience and your many sins, you used to live in sin just like the rest of the world, obeying the devil, the commander of the powers in the unseen world. He is a spirit at work in the hearts of those who refuse to obey God. All of us used to live that way, following the passion, desires, and inclinations of our sinful nature. So the Bible right there says at one point, all of us used to live in sin and we used to obey the devil. That may throw you for a loop and say, wait a minute, I did this? That's what the Bible says. And the struggle that, that we have, and whether we recognize it or not, is the struggle that we all have is determining who's going to be the authority in our lives. Is it going to be Jesus? Now, sometimes we say, it's, and I've said this before, and I, I haven't done a, the best job clarifying this, is we'll say, you're either going to follow Jesus, he's going to be the authority, he's going to be the God in your life, or you're going to be that person. But we leave it, we kind of end it, it, that you're going to be the one that makes those decisions. But what the Bible tells us is that it's not really you making those decisions, that if it's you directing things, at the end of the day, you're obeying the devil. Like you're, you're going down the path he wants you to go down. The path, in some ways, he's already trailblazed for us. And that helps to highlight to us the fact that there's this struggle, there's this battle, why following Jesus isn't always easy, why it's often a road less traveled. There's opposition. There's a battle that's happening on a daily basis for you, for your spouse, for your kids, for your grandkids, for your neighbors, for your coworkers. And that battle is about who is going to be the authority in your life, in my life. There's a prophecy in Daniel chapter 7, verses 13 and 14 in the Old Testament. And, and the Bible says, In my vision at night I looked, and there before me was one like a son of man, coming with the clouds of heaven. He approached the Ancient of Days and was led into his presence. He was given authority, glory, and sovereign power. All nations and peoples of every language worshipped him. His dominion is an everlasting dominion that will not pass away, and his kingdom is one that will never be destroyed. Daniel had this vision, he had this prophecy of, of the coming, the Son of Man. We, we've heard that term before, right? It, we see in the New Testament, Jesus, he, he refers to himself as the Son of Man. So Daniel right here is sharing that, that, that one day the Son of Man, that, that Jesus is going to come and he's going to be an authority, that his dominion will be everlasting, that his kingdom will, will, will never be destroyed, that, that one day this is going to happen. And Jesus, here in Matthew 28, tells the disciples, guys, I have the authority now. Ephesians chapter 1, verse 22 says, And God placed all things under his feet and appointed him to be head over everything for the church, which is his body, the fullness of him who fills everything in every way. So this is a reminder for us here at Church of the Bar. Right? Jesus is the authority. He is. Church of the Bar the Mason campus up here at Christ Church, we're, we're, we're under him. He's the authority. And the Bible's clear that he attained that authority, he achieved that authority, he achieved that place because of what he did at the cross when he died and rose again. That's placed him at the top. And what that means is we, you, me, the church, we're going to be about what he wants us to be about.
It's his agenda. It's what he wants us to do. So when he says, I want you to make disciples, that's why it has to be a part of who we are because he has the authority and that's what he wants us to do. Let's jump to our third question right now. And, and we're going to kind of throw out this idea of submission. And I know something, man, we, we don't like to submit. We don't like to submit to people. We, we want to be in charge. We want to be in control. So why is the idea of submitting to Jesus a hard step for so many people to take, right? Why is the idea of submitting to Jesus a hard step for people to take? Talk about that in your group. We'll be back, and we got one question left, and we're going to wrap things up today.
Okay, Church of the Bar, we are back. Three questions means we have one left. And um, where we kind of left things off, we are talking about Jesus and his authority. And th- this is important for us to understand because it, it really fits into our faith. See, sometimes you may have heard this term, a biblical faith or a saving faith. And you're like, what's that? Well, a biblical faith or a saving faith, well, it's just faith that comes from the Bible, involves the decision to stop all sin and to start obeying all the commands of Jesus in the Bible. Right? He has the authority. His expectations are for you and me to stop sinning and to start obeying his commands. Now, the key for this is this term decision because we make the decision to stop sinning and obeying everything he teaches us knowing that we're going to make mistakes at times. He doesn't expect perfection, but what he does expect is he expects us to submit to his authority. You see, here's the thing with faith. Sometimes we want to make faith just about believing the right things and, well, I've confessed it. Isn't that good enough? Maybe for some people or some places, but for Jesus, that's not good enough. He's clear in the scriptures. It's more than just confessing and believing who he is. It, it's, it's, it manifests itself in how we live our lives, right? James talks about the demons, and even the demons believe. But that doesn't save them. See, what he wants from you and from me is that we are, are not only willing to believe in who he is and what he did, that we're, we're not only willing to confess that, but that we are going to, in addition that we're going to commit and trust our lives to him and to living and doing what he wants us to do. Now I get it. I get it. We don't like being told what we need to do. Like We don't like getting, being told what we need to do. But Jesus is the authority. All right? Now, I, I know in that room down there, I don't know all of you, but I know some of you, you're pretty authoritative. You like, you like things to be your way, or you're like, it's my way or the highway. And so us being told what we need to do, some of us, we don't like that. But Jesus is the authority. He is. And the sooner we recognize that, and the sooner we live, like we not only read that, hear that, believe that, the sooner we're going to see some major differences in our lives, in Church of the Bar, in the kingdom, in our communities, in our families. See, sometimes we get hung up on the commands. And making disciples is a command, but I want to kind of reformat your thinking a little bit and, and remind you that, yes, it's a command, but it's also an opportunity to bring change to another person and to yourself. Like here, Here's the thing. And it's kind of a, I'll admit, it's kind of a selfish agenda because it benefits everything that we're doing. But I want you to experience transformation this year. And I'll tell you why it's, it's kind of a selfish thing in the moment. I want you to experience transformation this year. I want you to experience the power of Jesus working in your life this year. I want you to experience spiritual growth this year. Like I, I don't want your, your year spiritually just to be like, well, I, I show up at Church of the Bar, I, I'm engaged in some of these discussions, and that's it. I want you to be there. I want you to be engaging with people. I want you to bring people with you. I want people to notice that there's something different about you. And so you can tell them the story of, of hey, here's what's happening, is I'm showing up to the monkey bar on Sundays. And I know that people go there during the, re- during the, the, the week and you think, well, I'm going to go there and I'm going to get a drink or I'm going to get some food or I'm going to listen to some music. But I'm going there on Sundays and I'm experiencing something amazing in my life. I want you to be a part of it with me, right? I want you to become more like Jesus this year in how you interact with your spouse, with your kids, with your grandkids, with your coworkers. Like I, I want people to see something different in you. I want you to experience transformation. I want you to be transformed in how you deal with people that you don't even like. Because let's be honest, we interact with a lot of people on a daily basis where we, 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 we make a preconceived judgment, an idea on them. Like, oh, I don't know if I like this person or I don't like what they're wearing. I don't like the team they support. What would it look like if we experienced such a transformation that we stopped thinking less and less about those things and instead, man, we begin to see people how, the way Jesus did. 
people that either know him or need to know him. And I'm excited. I ran into some of you talking with Alice during Christmas Eve service about what's happening at Church of the Bar. And I think it's great. I want to see things even go to another level. And the reason I'm, I'm kind of, there's this agenda is, is I want to see the kingdom grow. I want to see your work down there grow. And I know that, that, that if you're transformed, if transformation's happening with you all at Church of the Bar, guess what? We're going to notice the difference there. And if people notice the difference and they're getting excited about it, it's, it's, going, to, it's going to spread. And, and I want to be able to, to share stories and brag to other people about what is happening down there at the monkey bar. But your key to making that happen, and it's all about experiencing transformation. And this is why his authority is so important. Because we can experience that transformation when we're willing to submit to his authority. Because when we put him first and we let him guide our steps, not only do our lives begin to change for the better, but those that are in our community, that are in our our kind of sphere that we live in, they'll experience that change as well. And this brings us to our last question today. And this is very self-reflective. So Think about this, be honest with yourself. Everything we've talked about today, right? We're just coming off this idea of of, of transformation. I want you to experience transformation. So in what area of of your life do you want to experience transformation in this year? What area do you want to experience transformation in and why is that so important to you? So, So take some time, wrap this up, and then we'll be back to close things up today.
All right, Church of the Bar, we are back, and, and I'm telling you, I'm still excited about this year. And so today we talked about the importance of making disciples, and, and we're going to be on this for a couple of months. And today, the two things we highlighted is, hey, we're going to have doubts, but that's where faith comes in. And we can't allow our doubts to kind of throw us off, and then we just closed up by the authority that Jesus has and how important it is for us to submit to that authority. Right, I, now I know. Um, You talk about two things, two areas that we can be sometimes struggle with are doubts and his authority. Those aren't the easiest to get through, but trust me, we can get through this. That's what community's for. That's what you have each other for. So let's commit ourselves to, man, following Jesus and and, and commit ourselves to the things we talked about today of, of experiencing transformation because we're willing to follow his lead, to follow his authority. It's going to be a great year. I am excited about what is going to happen with you. I'm excited about what's going to happen at Church of the Bar. And um, I'm looking forward to hearing some great stories about what's taking place and seeing what God does with you all this year. Let me pray for you today. And uh, then I'm going to turn things back over uh, to your leaders down there. And you guys are going to do what you're going to do at that point. Let's pray. Father, thank you for what you do. Uh, Thank you for how you love us. And thank you for... Um, just the opportunities you give us to uh, not only serve and follow you, but to uh, make an impact with other people. Father, help us to see those opportunities we may have missed in the past and, and make sure we're on the same page with you because we're excited about um, the work you've already done and the work that you want to get done um, in, 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 uh, in our lives and at Church of the Bar this year. We love you. It's in Jesus' name that we pray. Amen.